All right. Well, it is good to uh, be here. It's good to continue our series on uh, on prayer. And uh, this week that we had the, uh, our lawnmower stolen, and so uh, I started to pray. <laughs> and uh, the the, uh, the topic of tonight or today's message is uh, the frequency of prayer. The frequency of prayer. We've talked about the 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 function and the foundation. We've talked about the focus, the faith, the fervency, and this morning we're talking about the frequency of prayer. And uh, boy, having your lawnmower stolen really ramps up the frequency, doesn't it? You start to pray, and and uh, you start to pray for your mower back, and then you start to uh, even question how you're praying. You ever do that? You ever you ever question how you're praying? Like, Lord, is this the right thing to pray for? And and uh, we just spent almost $800 on that lawnmower to get it so it doesn't break down for some guy to drive it off our yard. And then I started to pray, Lord, I pray that that mower breaks down, you know? <laughs> you know, just punish this criminal. Would you do that, Lord? And no, Lord, I'm glad I fixed the mower for him, you know? <laughs> maybe, maybe the next guy won't, uh, <laughs> whatever, won't break down on him. Anyway, so uh, we need to work on our prayer life, don't we? We need to pray with certainly more frequency and and uh, when it comes to the frequency of our prayers, uh, can, I just, uh, can I just tell you this, that there's no magic number. Uh, there, there, there's no formula to the frequency by which we're, or, uh, by which we're supposed to pray. Uh, we've all heard that, uh, that less is, uh, is more, right? Uh, when it comes to prayer, that's just not the case. Uh, more is more. And we need to pray more. We need to pray uh, with more uh, fervency, as we talked about last week. But this week, we're talking about the frequency of our prayer. We need to pray. The more, the merrier, right? The more, the merrier. And uh, we have to keep in mind that our communication is with God. And uh, it's always so nice to be able to talk to people who you love, isn't it? And uh, I, I know that when, uh, when my kids come and talk to me, they love me, they want to have a... a they want to have a dialogue. They just want to be a monologue. However, sometimes I wonder about that. They, they just sit there and talk sometimes and never let me get in a word. But uh, they're like, we like to have a, a nice dialogue. And communicating with the one you love more often is very, very important. Uh, there are several Christians, many Christians, that say, uh, you know, I just don't have a, an intimate relationship with the Lord. I don't have the kind of relationship that Maybe, uh, maybe is needed to have a, a frequent prayer life. Well, can I just say that a lack of prayer is generally due to a lack of priority. A lack of prayer is generally due to a, a lack of priority, and the more Christ-centered that your life becomes, the more you pray. And the more you pray, the more Christ-centered your life becomes. It's this, uh, we call that a kind of a vicious circle, isn't it? And uh, in a good way, in a good way. But, uh, but we, our life becomes Christ-centered, and we pray, and then we pray, and our life becomes more Christ-centered, and then we pray, and then it becomes more Christ-centered, and we pray. And this is a cycle in life. When your priorities in life are straight, your prayer life will be strong. We need to remember that. Get your prayer life right, and your priorities will be strong. Get your priorities in life straight, and your prayer life will be strong. There's three things I want to talk about quickly this morning. I say quickly, but... I have a little more content than I, than I normally do. First of all, let's look real quickly. Pray always. That's the first point on your, on your uh, sheet. You have it in your bulletin. Pray always. Ephesians 6, and I'm going to jump around here a little bit. I'm going to read verse 10 and 11, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 18. I want you to follow along with me in your sheet. Uh, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11 Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Jump down to verse 18. It says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now verses 12 through 11 speak of this whole armor of God that we're supposed to put on. And uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 6 is very well known for that. You put on the whole armor of God, it says, that we might be able to stand against the devil. And uh, it, interestingly, we are told uh, these things we're supposed to put on. First of all, the, the belt of truth, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and we're supposed to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
So we're supposed to put on all of these things. We're supposed to have a, a sense of defense, right? And then we're supposed to have a sense of offense with the sword. But interestingly, uh, we can prepare and should prepare, but it says that we ought to pray. We ought to pray, and we ought to pray always, verse 18, Ephesians 6. Why? Because prayer is the catalyst. Prayer is the catalyst. In Proverbs 21, verse 31, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but the safety is of the Lord. You see, friends, we can and we should do all that we can and should do. This is something that's important. We should prepare ourselves. We should put on this belt and have the shoes and, and have our, the, the breastplate of righteousness and we should have our sword, which is the Word of God. And we should, we should do all of these things in order, to help us, in order to help us stand against the wiles of the devil. But in the end, verse 18, it says, but what? But pray. But pray. It's not all about protecting yourself. It's about praying to God who is the real protector. And notice too that this prayer is not just uh, for a saint like yourself, but for all saints. It's for all the saints everywhere. And why is that? Well, it's because we are all under attack. We are all under attack. Uh, note this, that the ones the devil is pursuing the most in the world are the ones that are most pursuing the work of the Lord. The devil does not care about lazy Christians. Did you know that? The devil doesn't care about, about mediocre Christians. What the devil cares about is he cares about the ones that are going to be doing something for the Lord. And you may have experienced this in your life as you begin to begin to uh, plot along and begin to serve God and, and you begin to pray more and, and with, with more frequency and more fervency and more faith focus and, and you understand all of that. And, and, and as you begin to do more things for God, the devil is a little harder on you, isn't he? Because he cares about that. He doesn't care about the, the Christian kind of sitting on the back burner just simmering. He cares about the Christian on the front burner with the flames up high. That's who he cares about. The devil isn't concerned with those who are lazy for the Lord, but he is concerned with those that love the Lord. Now let me just give you a quick application here. Some of us may say, well, <clears throat> well, I don't really feel like praying right now. Can I just say this, that you're in good company? Because I, I, I do that. I do that. I think everybody in this room here, if they were honest with themselves and the Lord, would say, there are times that I just don't feel like praying. There are times where it gets, it gets late or you get in a, in, a, in a hurry and you begin to just, you, you kind of you gloss over that, right? I think if, I, if we were all honest with ourselves, all of our prayer lives lack, and there are times when we don't feel like praying. And when we don't pray, when we should, right? Just recently, I, I had to apologize to my kids. I had, uh, I had lied to them. It was a horrible thing. It was a horrible thing, and I truly mean that. And, and we were all, uh, we were all uh, getting ready to eat dinner. And uh, you know how it gets at dinner time, and, and everybody's kind of hustling, and, and uh, especially in, in a young family, uh, with, with, a, with a, young, a young man like myself and, and uh, a very elderly Grey Goose. Um, and then my children, and we're all rushing. And, uh, and uh, usually I'm the guy that says, I'm the guy that says, whoa, whoa, whoa let's just pray. And, uh, and, and I, had, I had thought about praying, but the food was just overwhelming. And, and, uh, and, I, and I began to eat. My wife, she turns to me, she says, uh, she says honey, should we pray? And I said, yeah, I, I, I forgot. And uh, so we, uh, we prayed. And, and later, I was just overwhelmed with conviction. I was overwhelmed with conviction. You see, I did not forget to pray. I chose not to pray. And I had to go back to my kids, and I said, boys, I lied to you. Dad lied to you. I, I, it's, not that I, it's not that I forgot to pray. It's that I chose not to pray. And there are times in our lives when we just say, we just say, you know what, I'm just too busy for it, or I just can't afford to take the time to pray. And this is not uncommon. This is not uncommon. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, he says this, if your heart be cold in prayer, do not restrain prayer, 
until your heart warms, but pray your soul unto heat. He goes on to say, if the iron be hot, then hammer it. And if it be cold, hammer it until you heat it. And can I tell you something today, friends, that there are times in our lives that we just need to put the smack down. We need to pray even when we don't feel like praying. And it's unfortunate how oftentimes we don't feel like praying as we ought to pray. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit that intercedes on our behalf in Romans 8, 26. It says, for what we know not, what we should pray for as we ought, the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us. And I'm thankful for that. But you know what? We also, when we know we ought to pray, we ought to pray. In our lives, we struggle with that. So friends, can I just challenge you this morning that when you get to a point in your life where you say, you know what? The iron's just not hot right now. You hit it until you heat it. You just got to keep praying. You got to keep praying. Pray always. And friends, you are in great company this morning because there are a lot of people that just don't feel like praying sometimes. But we know that we ought to pray. So first of all, we need to pray always. Second of all, we need to pray for everything. We need to pray for everything. Recently on our, uh, on our Wednesday night uh, prayer service, we had everybody in this room and we began to uh, we go around the room and we take prayer requests from everybody. And it's a, really, it's a, it's a fun time. Uh, you get to know people and you get to know their prayer needs, their prayer requests. You get to know their needs. And we got to a young girl who was four years old. Her name is uh, Isabel. And uh, she, she had this uh, prayer request, I, I thought. And, and uh, you know, through coaxing, her mom and dad were, you know, come on, what, what do you got? What do you got? And, and we drew it out of her, and she wanted to pray for a stuffed animal. And uh, it's, uh, up until this point, it's an unnamed wild African dog. Am I still right on that? It's unnamed. It's just the wild African dog. That's a new stuffed animal. I can't tell you about what the, I don't know what the prayer request was other than strange. Because it was strange. I've never actually prayed for a, a stuffed animal. But you know what? Let me tell you something, friends. This is a great opportunity to show a four-year-old that you can pray for everything. And you can pray for anything. And we ought to. In the Bible, it says in Philippians 4, 6, God's word says this, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Praying for everything means we need to spend more time directing prayers rather than discounting them. And we spend a whole lot of time saying, boy, that's just unworthy to be prayed for. And I am so glad that a four-year-old little girl says to pray for her stuffed animal. You know why? Because that tells me she has a tender heart. And she has not been callous by the world who says that, that there are some things over here that maybe, uh, maybe you ought to pray for because they're worthy of prayer. And there's some things over here that you know, we can just discount those. I would rather direct than discount. And if you want to increase the frequency of your prayers, then we ought to learn like Isabel did to learn to pray for everything. Pray for anything. Uh, John R. Rice said something to this effect, if it's uh, it's worth wanting, it's worth praying for. And keep that in mind. Now interestingly, listen to this, that the word be careful just simply means take no thought. Or don't be anxious for. So Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, means take no thought. Take no thought. Now one of the greatest uh, parts of this, of this context, this passage, is not verse necessary 6, it's verse 7. Because instead of being anxious and having anxiety, you receive peace. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when we go to him, when we are, when we are uh, not at peace about something, we can go directly to God and we can acquire peace. Isn't that just a wonderful thing? So don't be anxious for it. You can have peace about it. You have peace. You know why you have peace? Here's why. Because you brought it to God. You know why you're not at peace? Because you think you got this one. And until you yield to God, you'll never be at peace. Because there's a lot of us who are trying to, in a sense, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. 
We're trying to say, I can get it done. I'm the guy who did it before. And why can't I do it this time? And we have no peace with that. But when you bring something to God and you say, Lord, you're going to have to deal with this one because I can't do it. There's a tremendous peace about it. A tremendous peace about it. When you were a kid, did you ever have a, you ever have somebody in, uh, in school that bullied you? <laughs> I think a lot, of, a lot of people did. A lot of kids did. And uh, I, I was, I was kind of one of those kids who got bullied sometimes, you know. And I went to uh, more than a dozen public schools before, before I graduated, before they, before they uh, gave me a, a, a diploma. <laughs> they wanted me out of school. I went <laughs> so anyways, I went to a lot of schools, and, and I was bullied. It was just kind of craziness. And, and uh, I remember I would, go, I would go home sometimes, and I would, I would tell my dad, and, uh, who, was, who, was, who was, now he's smaller than me. He has, uh, we call this little man syndrome. And uh, I would always tell Dad, I would, you know, I, I would say, wow, Dad, I mean, you're kind of small. And he says, yeah, but dynamite comes in small packages. Anyway, <laughs> that was his thing, apparently. But at the time, I was only about this big. And I'd get bullied in school. I'd go home and tell my dad. And I would say, uh, I would say Dad, so-and-so has, uh, you know, is, is pushing me around again. And you know what he would say? He would say, how dare they? I got this. And, uh, you know, there was just a, a sense of peace that came over me as I told my dad my burden. Because the problem was bigger than me, but it was not bigger than my dad. The problem may have been bigger than me, but it was not bigger than him. He can deal with anything, and in my eyes, he was God. I don't know about you, but my kids, they come to me sometimes, and they, 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 they share their burdens with me. They share their burdens with me. I say, Dad, so-and-so is being mean. I said, well, tell your brother to knock it off. No, okay. <laughs> they, say, uh, they say, you know, so-and-so's being mean. And you know what? They bring that to me because the problem is bigger than them. But it's not bigger than me, and I can deal with this. And let me just encourage you, friends, when, you, when we take our prayers to God, when we pray to God, we have a peace about it because the problem is not bigger than he is, though it may be bigger than we are. So we need to go to God. And the more we pray, the more we have peace. Uh, Corey Ten Boom said this, uh, any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made into a burden. And so even though you might say in your life, it, it's, this, 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 this is a burden to me, but I want to pray about it, you pray about that, and God will give you peace. Because the problem is never bigger than him. Uh, you know, David experienced peace in his life. Many, many times. Let me give you one example. It's just a good example. It's in Psalm chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 5. This is one of the examples of, of peace that David received when he prayed. Uh, in verse 1 it says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Now let me just stop there and add a, a, just a, a bit of commentary. You ever feel like that? You ever feel maybe like David, where you, where, where, where those that uh, that trouble you are, are they're they're increasing, and they that rise up against you, maybe um, maybe in your life you maybe have struggled with something where you feel like, boy, there's a there's not just one giant in the land, there are giants all over, and they are increasing. Verse two: Many uh, there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. He went to bed after he prayed. He woke and he said, God is good. I'm not worried about anything. The more faith David gained, get this, the more faith David gained and the more fervent his prayers became, the more frequent David prayed. Again, we're back to this vicious cycle, if you will. As you see your prayers get answered, you, you begin to grow in your faith. And as you begin to grow in your faith, you begin to pray more frequently. And as you pray more frequently, you have more fervency in your prayer. 
The more prayers get answered, the more faith, the more frequency, and then the more fervency. You see, the wider the faith, the, the lengthier the frequency, and the deeper the fervency. And so what ends up happening in your prayer life is you begin to pray and the whole thing just gets bigger, deeper, and longer. You see what I'm saying? It just continues to grow. And that's an example from David's life. And he began to grow and he began to grow and he began to have more faith. And his faith widened and his fervency uh, deepened and his frequency lengthened. And this is, the, this is what happened in his life. Now let me just give you a quick bit of application because here are some things we can pray about. Here are some things we can pray about. First of all, you can pray about your children. It's a good thing to pray about. I hope you pray about your children. If you don't have children, then pray for someone else's children because they need it too. But pray for your children and start when they're, when they're this big. Start when they're really, really little. Can I share? I'll share some things that I pray about for my kids. I pray for their, for, for their wives. I do. I pray for their future wives. And I ask the Lord, I say, Lord, I want my children, my, my, my boys to be pure for, for those ladies. And I want those ladies to be pure for my boys. And I pray about this, and that's a good prayer. My wife and I, we pray about this stuff at night. We pray that, that God is preparing some, some, some wonderful daughter-in-laws for my boys. Pray for your children. Pray for your marriage. If you're not married, pray for other people's marriages. They need it too. Pray for your marriage. Pray for all sorts of things with, within your marriage. Pray that you can grow closer together. This is something we can pray for everything, right? Why can't you pray for this? Pray that you, you, your marriage continues to grow. Pray for your government, as we did this morning. Pray for godly leadership within government. Pray that they are sensitive to the Spirit's leading in their life. Pray that they don't quench, they don't grieve the Spirit, but they yield to the Holy Spirit's work in their life. Because if there's anybody that we want to be spiritual, it's probably them. What about your church? Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor. Pray for me. I am asking you to pray for me. You know what one of the, some of the greatest text messages I, I, I ever have gotten? And it's not Ed McMahon saying you've won a million, you know. Uh, some of the greatest prayers, uh, things, or text messages I've got from people are saying, Pastor, I'm praying for you this morning. You, you, you have no idea the effect that that has on me. Now, I try to pull out my phone and I try to text people randomly throughout the week and say, hey, I'm praying for you. Not just say I'm praying for you, but pray and then send them the text. Don't just say I'm praying because that does no good. That's a lie. And then you've got to confess your faults one to another, and, and you've got to just say, Pastor, I lied to you, and, and that's always harsh. But anyway, so pray for people. Send them text messages. Say, hey, I'm praying for you. In the morning when you wake up, when you're reading your Bible, spend time praying for me. Pray for the church. Can I tell you, I'll, I'll give you one specific thing to pray for me about. Can you do this one thing? Pray for my holiness. Pray that I'm spiritual. Would you do that? Would you commit that to your prayer life when you get up in the morning and say, just, I want to pray that pastor is holy, that he is pure. That would be a huge blessing for me. We have all sorts of things, uh, but it, God puts these in our lives for a reason. All sorts of things that we need to pray for, but we should pray for everything. We should pray always and for everything. Uh, thirdly, we should pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the most clear commands in Scripture about prayer comes from 1 Thessalonians 5. It just doesn't get any better than this. And we think about, well, well, how often shall we pray? What are some things we can pray? How often shall we pray? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. That, that's, that's big. That's big. That's huge. Pray without without stopping. That's what that's saying. That means to say, pray and don't stop. Just have a continued dialogue with God. Just continue to pray. Pray always. Pray without ceasing. When we are, listen to this, when we are most dependent on God, we are most frequent in prayer. And when we pray all the time, it's an extension of our dependence on God. So as you pray, 
you are depending on him. And conversely, when we begin to not pray, we are not depending on the Lord. Listen to this. This is great. Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 3. Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 3. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. Now listen to verse 3. This is where we get into this. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. And then, look what he did. And then he fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. The whole reason for God removing from them provision and then giving them provision is that they might know that the reason they are who they are is because of God. That is why God is showing the children of Israel that he is the ultimate provisionary. And how often in our lives do we forget that he is the one that's providing? It's not Joe Huss that's providing. It's not you that are providing individually for yourselves. It ultimately comes from God. And when we take God out of the picture, we take dependence out of him, or on him out of the picture, our prayer life is going to be hindered. We're not going to pray as frequently as we ought. We need to pray frequently. We need to pray frequently, and that comes through dependence on God. The more dependent we are, the more communication we have with him because we need to tell him what we need. You know, my kids are this way. We have a real close relationship right now because they, they need things. They need clothes and they need, they need, uh, they need shelter. And uh, they, apparently I never feed them because they're always hungry. And uh, maybe your kids are that way. And uh, so, so they need food. They need all of these things. And you know what? They, they come to me and they say, Dad, I need these things. You know what they're doing? They're depending on me, aren't they? Now, as they grow up, as they mature, and they, uh, they begin to become self-sustained, they will not depend on me as much. And you know what will happen? We will communicate less and less and less and less. Why? because there's less and less and less dependence on me to provide for them. And so it is in the Christian life. When we believe that we got this one, Lord, I got this one figured out. I dealt with this last time, and I'll deal with it again. We're not going to pray to him. We're not going to ask him for things, and we certainly, we certainly are not going to praise him for the things which he's given to us because we don't even acknowledge that he's the one who did it. We acknowledge that we're the one who did it. That I, the reason that I am successful is not because of God, but because of me. And so how can you praise God for that? We don't praise God for that. We take all the credit, unfortunately. Let me just give you some application. If you are not praying as frequently as you ought, I just want to give you two questions that I want you to ask yourselves. Two questions. Ask yourself, who are you depending on for all you need in life? If you're not praying as frequently as you ought, ask yourself this question. Who are you depending on for all you need in life? It's a good question. Are we depending on yourself? Are you depending on yourself? Or am I depending on me? And then second question, ask yourself, who provides all life's needs? Who provides all life's needs? Is that you? Are you providing everything you need in life? Because you're certainly not going to pray about it if you're providing it. Now watch the connection between verses 17 and 18 and verse 1 Thessalonians 5. So we're supposed to pray without ceasing, right? Verse 17, short to the point. I love that verse. Verse 18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Pray and give thanks. 
when you see that God is providing, you give thanks to him. It's a wonderful connection. And so it's amazing that when you, when you back this up a little bit and you say we have become a very unthankful country, we have become a very unthankful people, we have to ask ourselves, who's providing? Because am I going to thank myself if I think that I'm the sole provisionary? Of course not. But when you allow God, not just even allow, when you acknowledge that God is the one who provides for you, you begin to be thankful. You thank him for all the things that he gives to you and allows you really to have. Thanklessness comes from self-sufficiency where thankfulness comes from a dependency on God. He is the one that supplies our needs. Philippians 4.19 says this, But my God shall supply all your need. But my God shall supply all your need. You think that you provided? You didn't provide anything. You didn't provide anything. Even if you don't think that God is the one that provided it, guess what, friends? He's the one that provided it. We can do nothing of ourselves. 419, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Pray frequently. And the way we pray frequently is by having a dependence on God. Jonathan Edwards says prayer is as natural an expression of faith as breathing is of life. And so you want to increase your faith? Pray. You know why? Because prayer then will increase your faith. It will increase its length, its depth, its width, the whole thing. Just this whole object, this big object just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you begin to pray and trust in God. Now in conclusion, I want to just read something real quick. Uh, I've, I've read a lot of these books on prayer recently, and I just pray that, I, I might, this is my prayer, my, pray is, my prayer is that, is that I don't stop reading these books on prayer when I'm done with this series. Because there's so much to learn. This is just one thing out of the book I read. It's on page 210 of a book that Charles Spurgeon wrote. It's called Encourage to Pray. Here's what it says. He's talking about the frequency of prayer. A missionary some years ago returning from southern Africa gave a description of the work which he had been accomplished there, or which had been accomplished there. Through the preaching of the gospel and among other things, he pictured a little incident of which he had been an eyewitness. He said that one morning he saw a converted African chieftain sitting under a palm tree with his Bible open before him. Every now and then he cast his eyes on his book and read a passage, and then he paused and looked up a little while, and his lips were seen to be in motion. Thus he continued alternately to look down on the scriptures and turn his eyes upward toward heaven. The missionary passed by without disturbing the good man, but a little, a little while after he mentioned to him what he had seen and asked him why it was that sometimes he read and sometimes he looked up. The African replied, I look down to the book and God speaks to me. And then I look up in prayer and speak to the Lord. And in this way we keep up a holy talk with each other. Is that the reality of your life? Do you have a continued talk with the Lord? And do you walk outside in the morning and, and, and get a, a breath, a fresh air, and say, thank you, Lord, for that? And you get into your automobile and say, thank you, Lord. And uh, you look down at your gas gauge and you say, wow, Lord, I hope I can make it to the gas station. And you pull into the gas station and say, thank you, Lord. I'm here at the gas station. And do you look over and you say, well, I sure hope, Lord, I pray that, the, that, that, the, that the, uh, the gas is cheap here at this gas station. You look over and say, wow, Lord, thank you. The gas is cheap here. And you say, Lord, I, I really have to make this meeting now at, at work, and I've got to be there by 8.15, and I just pray, Lord, I can make it on time. And, and maybe you show up at 8.17, and you say, thank you, Lord, for not getting me in an accident. I appreciate that very much, Lord. Even though I'm a little late, I hope that they're okay with this. And you get in there, and, and the boss or the, the person you're talking to is raging, and you just pray, and you say, Lord, I just pray that they're just not angry at me. And maybe they're angry at you, and you say, Lord, give me peace. And he gives you peace, and you say, thank you, Lord, for that. 
And then you go on to your next meeting and something similar happens. And, and maybe you, 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 you go walk by someone and say, Lord, this person needs a little hand. I'm going to give this person some help. And I just pray you'd give me the right words. And, and you're able to talk to this person. And then they, you help them and they say thank you. And you say, well, praise God for that. I'm, I'm so glad I can help you. Thank you, Lord. And is this, the, is, is this the tone of your day? Do you go out and do you constantly have a communion with God? Or do we only seek Him when there's something that we cannot handle? You say, Lord, you can't, you, you, you're the only person that can help in this situation, so I, 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 am, I have to go to you because there is none other. Or do you come to Him in, in praise as well? I hope that we can have this kind of conversation with the Lord ongoing all day long. We are constantly praying and thanking Him for all that He does for us. We need to increase our frequency. Increase the frequency of prayer, but it's solely going to be dependent on you trusting God for all of your life's needs and thanking Him for all that He's provided. And that's the truth of it. Friends, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I think everybody here does. But this is the one thing in my life that I just think to myself, I am so thankful for all the time that I have salvation. That I know for sure where I am going when I die. I want you to watch this. I want this hand right here to represent you and me. I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us but hates our sin. Every one of us has sin. Every one of us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, is what the Bible says. The Bible also says that there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You know that? And so here we are with our sin. The Bible says that in order to get to heaven, this sin has to be paid for. Listen to this. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not church membership. You can come to this church, be a member of this church. That won't get you to heaven. You can give money to the church, and that doesn't get you to heaven. The wages of sin is death. Not giving money to the church. People say, well, if you just turn over a new leaf and try to be a good person, the wages of sin is not being a good person. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die. Do you know why? Because that's what the Bible says. That's what God said. I want this hand right here, and I mean it reverently, to represent the Lord Jesus. He came to this earth to die on the cross for our sin. He didn't come down to this earth to be a, a, a member of a church. He didn't come to this earth to, to pray a certain prayer and to, and to walk an aisle or to raise a hand and to get baptized. He came to this earth to die on the cross for our sin because that is the wage of sin when we take our faith, we believe that Jesus died. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, For by grace are you saved by faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. It's not of works. It's nothing that you can do to earn salvation. It's what Jesus has already done on the cross for us. He paid for it. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that, that we can go to God and that we can pray and we can thank Him for all that He has done and that we can go to somebody who is much bigger than us and ask for things that we cannot deliver on. I'm so thankful for that. It's just like going to my dad when I was a kid. I said, Dad, this, I can't handle this. And he would say something like this, Well, I got this one. The problems may be bigger than me, but they're not bigger than him. And so we need him. And we need to trust Him as our Savior.